The Amazon cloud is about to swallow the world, Reddit on free speech, and an action figure with your face on it. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 342 for Wednesday, May 20th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron sends you all of the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. Welcome to Tech News Tonight. This is the show where we talk about the tech news with the people who love it as much as you do. I am Megan Maroney. Now let's get to today's big news. At an event in New York City today, Spotify announced new features that would make the service more of an entertainment hub and less of the streaming music app known for not having Taylor Swift's 1989 album. The new features include access to video and audio shows, including all your favorite shows right here on Twit. There's also a new start page. I'm very excited about this feature. It's called Spotify Running. It includes recommendations based on your listening history and creates original playlists that are tuned to your individual exercise tempo that Spotify will detect. All the new features will be rolling out soon. Joining us today to talk about a few stories he's posted up on Business Insider is Matt Weinberger. Matt is a cloud computing expert. He knows the IT enterprise space inside and out. He's formerly of Computer World, now a tech reporter at Business Insider. Welcome, Matt. Hey, thanks for having me. So let's start with some Amazon news. You write that according to a new industry report from Gartner Research, Amazon Cloud is 10 times as big as the next 14 competitors behind them combined. Microsoft comes in second place. They have twice as much capacity as the next 13 on the list. So basically what you're saying is every other cloud service should just give up now. Not necessarily, because like, I used to work for a guy who liked to say that Amazon is like the Walmart of the cloud, right? Like it's one size fits all. You go in, you get your stuff, but it's the same stuff that you're going to get in every other Walmart and every other place in the country. But once in a while you want the the, the nice butter. I don't know. I'm, I'm hungry. Uh, but you want something a little more specialized, right? And that's where the other cloud providers fall in. They can build, the best of them are going to build successful businesses for themselves, serving very specific needs. Amazon Web Services is going to be enough for most people, but there's plenty of room for the other guys. And Microsoft's not going to take this line down either. So it's not over yet. So who's number three? Is Google number three? Google is usually accepted to be number three, but they don't really release any numbers about that for who knows what reason. So your guess is as good as mine. It's usually pretty well accepted. The big three here are Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, just because they have the biggest data centers and they're, they're the biggest tech providers in the world. You know what I mean? Right. So what you're talking about is Amazon Web Services when you're talking about cloud. You're not talking about like, how, you know, who has the most of my photos uploaded. In there. No, no, no. This is Amazon Web Services. So this is like the way to think about it. It's like the plumbing that underpins so much of the Internet. Um, like Tumblr hosts every picture on there with Amazon Cloud Storage. That counts against this number. Um, I can't think Airbnb is all hosted on Amazon Web Services or mostly hosted on web, Amazon Web Services these days. And that's all, it's all the secret plumbing that no user should ever really care about, but that keeps these sites up and running even when millions of people are using them at once. Right. So you have another piece today about an interview that Reddit CEO Ellen Pau did on NPR. She said Reddit had no intention of being a free speech platform. This was, of course, in response to a Reddit blog post last week that said the social network was going to start cracking down on harassment. The post was criticized for being vague and also for going against what a lot of people saw was the spirit of Reddit. Uh, What did you think about the original blog post that was posted last week? I think the original blog post, I kind of, my personal, not speaking for Business Insider, I guess, but my personal opinion is that it was very, very well-intentioned. And I think it was so important that Reddit took a stand against this because who's who's in favor of harassment, right? Uh, Don't answer that. (laughs) Not me. Uh, Yeah, right? Uh, But at the same time, it would have been really heartening to see specific rules, specific punishments. And even in this NPR interview, the thing that was so frustrating was that, so the, the issue at hand, the thing that prompted that comment from Ellen Powell was a question about, whether or not they would delete the actual very real subreddit, uh, sub community on Reddit called Gas the Kikes. Mm. Uh, and would, would she delete that? And if, if a Jewish user said that made them uncomfortable or feel unsafe. And she was like, well, 
maybe kind of, uh, you know, we have to define safe. We have to figure out who, who's affected by this. You know, we don't want to create a, a totally free speech platform, but it's important that people feel safe. And it's kind of a non-answer that only makes things more confusing, I think. Right. I mean, that was a very clear question and she didn't say that. That's that, right. It's like, a yes or no question. Right. And it's only making things, it's it's only exacerbating the, the panic on Reddit right now. I think that story has been posted and deleted from Reddit like six times today. <laughs> so what do you think Reddit will have to do if they're really serious about fighting harassment? <sighs> I mean, that's a really tough question. Um, it's kind of like what hill do they want to die on? If they really want to be a free speech platform, then they need to commit to it and and kind of let it die that way. Or... They can, they're going to, they just are. They're going to alienate a huge chunk of their users by enforcing these anti-harassment policies. But they need to just get rid of them and work on, as, as she notes, they're working on tools to, to get rid of repeat offenders who use new accounts. Um, so they're do, So that's a big positive step, but there's still no clear rules. There's no clear timeline there. You know what I mean? Right. Well, you and I have talked in the past a few times about harassment on Twitter. Um, how do you think their issues are the same uh, or different? Well, it's that you can't, you, you have to respect the First Amendment, the free speech, whatever, but at the same time, you also have to respect that some people's opinions are terrible and hate-filled <laughs> and possibly, probably illegal. Um, the issues that they have are walking that fine line between getting rid of the bad stuff and actually silencing dissent, which is what the worst critics on both platforms accuse the, the company of. Right. I mean, it, it does sort of, it's, it's interesting that she did bring up the unsafe, like yep. if someone feels unsafe, but I mean, that needs, that is a little vague, a little bit. So. That's right. That's exactly it. And it's, and again, it's so good that she's talking about this and I'm entirely in favor of talking about safety as a, as a value here. But there needs to be, if this is going to have any teeth whatsoever, they need to have a clear definition of safe or unsafe. Right. So and tell me, involved. right. So let's move on to another story you posted about Microsoft Flow. Uh, this is a rumored app. Um, it will allegedly take my emails and turn them into instant message type conversations. Mm -hmm. I would like this. Can you tell me about it? Well, so there's a couple other apps that do the same thing. Um, I, I linked to one called MailTime. I know there are several others, but it, it takes... It takes email and it makes it into an instant message conversation. So there's no reason why, there's no good reason why when we're emailing back and forth, we have to say, hi, Megan, how are you? You can just email back and forth. And so the big problem with most messaging apps these days, if I want to use Facebook Messenger, the other person I'm talking to has to use Facebook Messenger, right? Mm -hmm. But who doesn't have email? Like right. literally every human on the planet has email at this point, or almost literally. Uh, this just makes it something that sits next to your normal mail client and you just talk back and forth. It seems pretty cool. Right. Well, that's good because if you want to, you know, if you wanted to use it with like your mom and say, you know, right. I can't convince her to get on WhatsApp. So, like, you know, this is a good solution. And then if you, I, again, this is rumored. So who knows what the final product will actually be like. But it also means that I can just message my mom something. And if she doesn't want to get flow, she just sees it as an email. Right. So we, but I'm still talking to her in this kind of instant messagey kind of app. Right. Well, we should say by rumor, it was some someone found it and someone uh, at yeah. Microsoft alleged, you know, accidentally posted it somewhere online where someone found it and then tweeted a picture yeah. of it saying, you know, if you really, if you don't want it, you know, if it's really confidential, don't <laughs> make it publicly That's accessible. Exactly right. That's exactly right. And then today, um, I haven't updated the story or anything yet, but uh, screenshots allegedly leaked of what this app would actually look like. And it looks like pretty much the other messaging app. And Microsoft did a really, really bad job keeping the secret. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so it was also pointed out that part of why it was so easy to find is could is that it could have just been an internal test and never actually intended for release. Mm. That said, again, seems cool, seems useful. Right. So uh, finally, at the Game Developers Conference a few months ago, you got yes. to visit a booth from 3D Plus Me. They scanned your face and put it on an action figure. Uh, your action figure just arrived. What do you think of it? I mean, it looks like me, but I don't know if that's a good thing. It weirds me out every single time I look at it because uh, that's my own face staring back at me. Uh, the other thing is I kind of wanted an action figure that had action, but if you look at it, it's it, it's got one pose, you know? It's stuck there. It, it'll never be able to date uh, anyone's Barbies, you know? <laughs> I was going to ask really you if you were going to, like, have it, you know, fighting Han Solo or something, it, you know, it wouldn't. 
I seriously considered it, but it just stands there. Right. That, that's the most unfortunate part. That said, it is pretty crazy that we live in a time where this is just a thing that happens and it's more or less no big deal. Right. And has your gamer tag to, on there too, right? Yeah. For all that Halo, I don't play anymore. <laughs> right. you know, if, if anyone, I kind of hope, I, I kind of hope against hope that someone's going to read that story and add me on Xbox Live and maybe it'll get me to play again. But not, not holding my breath. Okay. How much does it cost? Um, I, for the one I got, I believe it was around $45. If you get bigger ones, it's a little more. If you get a smaller one, it's slightly less. But they're kind of pricey for something that you can't really play with, I think. Right. That's mostly for your cube or your girlfriend's that's, cube in your or case. My, that's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> Matt, thank you so much. Matt Weinberger is tech reporter at Business Insider. He's a prolific Twitterer at Matt underscore Wein, W-E-I-N. Thank you for joining us again, Matt. Thanks for having me. Take care. You too. Bye. Coming up, another health insurer gets hacked, and it's not pebble time yet. But first, this episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by the fine people at Blue Apron. Here is something to ponder. If you remove one weekly task off your to-do list, if you got to do that, what would it be? For me, it would be going to the grocery store. I have nothing against the fine people at Petaluma Market. They're nice, and they don't even make fun of me when I pay with my Apple Watch. But I just don't have the time to go to the grocery store. And that is where Blue Apron comes in. Blue Apron makes cooking delicious meals easy and fun. They deliver fresh, ready-to-cook meals right to your door. For less than $10 per meal, Blue Apron sends you fresh ingredients in all the exact proportions with step-by-step -step recipe instructions, including beautifully printed pictures. No trips to the grocery store and no waste from unused ingredients. Giant bottle of blueberry-infused truffle oil that I only used once in a recipe. I'm talking to you. Blue Apron is perfect for date night, cooking with friends, and they even offer family plans with kid-friendly ingredients so the whole family can eat well and have fun preparing the meals together. Each balanced meal is 500 to 700 calories per serving. Cooking takes half an hour. Shipping is free, and the menus are always new. They won't send the same meal twice. Blue Apron's experts source only the best seasonal ingredients for incredible meals like vegetable bibimbap with asparagus, shiitake mushrooms, and fried eggs, and duka crusted catfish with sugar snap peas, and couscous salad. You'll cook incredible meals and be blown away by the quality and the freshness. Blue Apron, it's a better way to cook. Check out this week's menu and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's right, two free meals just for going to blueapron.com slash twit. And we thank Blue Apron for their support of Tech News Tonight. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. Today, health insurer Care First disclosed a data breach that may have affected up to 1.1 million customers, according to the New York Times. Care First is located in Maryland and serves the Washington, D.C. area. They disclosed the attack that happened last June and said that hackers gained access to customer names, email addresses, and birth dates, but not medical records or social security numbers. In a related story, a report today by the Pew Research Center will surprise absolutely no one. It found that Americans have very little confidence that the government or agencies that collect information from them can keep that information private and secure. In fact, only 6% of adults say they are very confident that government agencies can keep their records private and secure. An inside source passed on the rumor to TechCrunch that smartwatch maker Pebble is in trouble. The company has $18 million in the bank, but recently turned to a Silicon Valley bank for a $5 million loan and a $5 million line of credit. Meanwhile, I have yet to receive my Pebble watch, and I have a sinking feeling that it's not going to live up to the love I have for this guy. And speaking of this, Apple Watch 9 to 5 Mac reports that Apple will begin to start selling bands in limited qualities in their stores as early as this week. This news comes on the heels of yesterday's announcement by Tim Cook that the Apple Watch will be available in stores by June. One hopes that those of you still waiting for the watch you ordered weeks ago will get yours before then. And finally, Engadget pointed us to a story about a teen in Idaho who's been charged with a felony for a distributed denial of service attack that took down his, his entire school district's network. Now, some teenage hackers are sometimes seen as heroes, but I have a feeling this one might not be seen as such from his peers. The DDoS attack not only caused the school district's internet access to go down, but also resulted in some students having to take the state standardized test multiple times, when once is probably too many. Also, the student allegedly paid someone to take down the network. He did not even do it himself. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Today's TN2 selfie fan of the day is Hayes Bonner, who never misses an episode of Tech News Tonight, which may or may not be because he is my nephew. Thank you, Hayes. Send us your selfies. 
Tag your pitch pictures with hashtag TN2Selfie on Twitter, Google+, Instagram, or via email at TN2 at twit.tv. Tell us a little bit about yourself and we will show your selfie on the show. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write to us at TN2 at twit.tv. And you can watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. And if you're not already on Spotify, what are you waiting for? You can soon watch us there, too. Don't miss our morning news program, Tech News, today every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.